Essentially disfellowshipped ones are still being treated as though they're invisible. The only difference is that they can now be greeted and they can now be invited to go to the meetings. So if you are being shunned right now by Jehovah's Witness family, expect them, unless you are a known apostate, as we're going to come to, expect them to reach out to you and say, hey, have you thought about going to the meetings? <laughs> That's the difference. Jehovah's Witnesses can now bombard you with invitations to go to the meetings. And if you go to a meeting, you can look forward to the privilege of a Jehovah's Witness saying hi to you. That's the change. Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to the attic. Boy, do we have a lot to talk about because there has been a governing body update video presented by a bearded Mark Sanderson giving changes or updates on the procedures for shunning and disfellowshipping. Not to mention another change regarding clothing for women there's so much to unpack, and just as a disclaimer at the start of the video, I think when we hear about changes regarding shunning, we instinctively think, thank goodness, the governing body has finally got the message, they're finally relaxing the rules, they're finally going to make the organisation less culty and make it possible to leave with dignity without having your family weaponized against you in a form of emotional blackmail. I can imagine lots of former Jehovah's Witnesses or, or those who are disfellowshipped themselves having a lot of anticipation about the organization going in that direction with this announcement. But when you actually examine what Mark Sanderson is about to say. Unfortunately, again, this is a disclaimer, I don't think they're going anywhere near far enough, and I'm going to explain why. But without further ado, let's roll the first clip. Welcome to our update. How did the 2023 annual meeting affect you? Remember the information that highlighted Jehovah as the merciful judge of all the earth? We were thrilled to learn that individuals who died in the flood of Noah's day, in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and even some who might repent during the Great Tribulation, could benefit from Jehovah's mercy. Since hearing that information, have you found yourself thinking a lot about Jehovah's mercy? Well, so has the governing body. In our prayerful study, meditation, and discussions, we've focused our attention on how Jehovah has dealt with people who engaged in serious sin. In this update, we'll briefly consider the pattern Jehovah set in the Bible record. Then we'll discuss some new information regarding the way we'll handle cases of wrongdoing in the Christian congregation. So yes, apparently it's taken them this long as a governing body to discuss being merciful. <laughs> it was the annual meeting of 2023 that got the whole conversation started. How is this impressive? How, how has it taken you this long to give this particular subject that is having such a devastating impact on people's lives, how has it taken you this long to give this prayerful thought, to consult the scriptures, to do studying, why is it just your own annual meeting, your own corporate Apple launch event <laughs> that has led to you having these conversations, would be my question. So during this update, uh, Mark Sanderson is going to discuss various Bible 
precedents for Jehovah being merciful. I'm going to spare you all of those. You can watch the whole update if you want to. I didn't find them very impressive. And all the while, as he was going through these examples, I was thinking, you know, well, you're just giving examples of why you as an organization are profoundly unmerciful and profoundly cruel when it comes to not just your former treatment of disfellowshipped ones, but as we're going to see, your present treatment of them. The governing body has prayerfully considered how Jehovah's mercy could be better reflected when dealing with wrongdoers in the congregation. And that's led to a clearer understanding of three scriptures. Let's consider the first. It's 2 Timothy 2, verses 24 and 25. There, Paul said, For a slave of the Lord does not need to fight, but needs to be gentle toward all, qualified to teach, showing restraint when wronged, instructing with mildness those not favorably disposed. Perhaps God may give them repentance, leading to an accurate knowledge of truth. How does a clearer understanding of 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25 adjust our current arrangement? Presently, a committee of elders normally meets with a wrongdoer only one time. However, the governing body has decided that the committee may decide to meet with the person more than once. Why? At Revelation 2, 21, regarding that woman Jezebel, Jesus said, I gave her time to repent. We hope that through the loving efforts of the elders, Jehovah will help a wayward Christian to come back to his proper senses and repent. If he repents, the committee will provide shepherding so that the person can escape from Satan's snares and keep making straight paths for his feet. This arrangement reflects the same effort that Jehovah personally made to help David and the nation of Israel to repent. So here's what I think Mark Sanderson is saying here, and apparently we're going to get clarification on all of this in forthcoming Watchtower articles and in written direction to elders. So it will be interesting to examine the small print. But just kind of reading between the lines, my take on this is that the governing body want to make it harder for people to get disfellowshipped in the first place. I think that's what they're saying. They're saying rather than having a one-off judicial committee, the aim of which is to establish repentance, indeed insist on a level of repentance exceeding the person simply saying, look, I'm sorry, I really shouldn't have done that, it won't happen again. In the existing arrangement, that simply won't wash with the Judicial Committee. They have their own standard that they're looking for. And if they feel that a person is lacking in works befitting repentance, if their actions aren't in harmony with their words, then even the person simply expressing verbally their repentance won't be considered enough. Even just saying, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry about this, wouldn't be enough, and they would still get disfellowshipped if the committee isn't satisfied that they are repentant. It sounds like that system of doing things is being done away with, and they're now going to have multiple committee meetings with someone, the aim of which is to just get them to agree to being repentant and agree to having a series of shepherding visits where they can be adjusted from their wrong course. It sounds like they just want to stop losing quite so many members and the way they're doing that is to make it harder to be disfellowshipped. What about baptized minors, those under 18 years of age, who engage in serious wrongdoing? Under our current arrangement, such a baptized minor, along with his Christian parents, must meet with a committee of elders. Under our new arrangement, 
two elders will meet with the minor and his Christian parents. The elders will find out what steps the parents have already taken to help their child come to repentance. If the minor has a good attitude and the parents are reaching him, the two elders might decide that it isn't necessary to take the matter any further. Of course, the elders will occasionally check with the parents to make sure that the minor is getting the help he needs. However, what if a baptized minor unrepentantly persists in a wrong course? In that case, a committee of elders would meet with him along with his Christian parents. The governing body is confident that these adjustments reflect Jehovah's desire to lead sinners to repentance. He wants them to come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. So again, not much of a change. They're just tweaking the process slightly to make it a little bit more difficult to get disfellowshipped here in the case of a baptized minor. So obviously Jehovah's Witnesses can get baptized as young as six or seven, according to examples in the literature. You know, you have this situation where witnesses are pledging their lives to an organization before they're even old enough to fully understand their religion and certainly before they're old enough to know what their beliefs will be once they're an adult. And then you have this inevitable situation where a good percentage of children of Jehovah's Witnesses end up doing something that violates the plethora of rules that can get you disfellowshipped. Ordinarily, it would be a judicial committee meeting with the baptized minor and the parents. And now what Mark Sanderson is saying is, we don't even need to go straight to a judicial committee in those cases. We're just going to send to elders to basically check out the situation and find out whether the baptized minor is repentant and see what the parents are doing and basically give the parents the support that they need. And if the baptized minor, the young Jehovah's Witness who's made some mistake, only if they are adamant that they haven't done anything wrong or they insist on carrying on with whatever it is they're doing, only then will we instigate the judicial committee process. So it's just tweaking things slightly and identifying another area in which the organization is losing members. The governing body is clearly in panic mode and trying desperately to stop the hemorrhaging and they're identifying this area of people not just getting disfellowshipped too readily, but specifically baptized minors getting disfellowshipped too hastily. And they're trying to just slow that whole thing down so that they can keep more members. Let's move on to our second scripture. It's 1 Corinthians 5, 13, which says, Remove the wicked person from among yourselves. The Bible clearly teaches that an unrepentant wrongdoer should be removed from the congregation. And really, it's a consequence that the wrongdoer has chosen. Why so? Because he refuses to respond to repeated loving attempts by the elders to lead him to repentance. Even when the elders inform a person that he's being removed from the congregation, he won't be left hopeless. The committee will not simply explain what steps he can take to be welcomed back into the congregation. What else will they do? The elders will explain that they'd like to meet with the individual again after a few months to see if he's had a change of heart. If the individual is willing to meet, the elders will make a warm appeal for him to repent and return. What about individuals who were disfellowshipped in the past, perhaps even many years ago? In some cases, they may not even recall the reason they were disfellowshipped. They may have abandoned their wrong course years ago. The governing body has decided that the elders should visit such ones, pray with them, and make a warm appeal for them to return 
to the congregation. If a person's been away from the congregation for many years, he would no doubt be very weak spiritually. Therefore, if such a person is willing, the elders could arrange for him to have a Bible study even before he's reinstated. Of course, the individual would have to want to return to the congregation, and the elders would always be the ones to arrange for such a study. So two things immediately leap out at me here. The first is Mark Sanderson disgustingly blaming shunned people for being shunned. You heard there him describing how those who are disfellowshipped choose the consequences. They choose to be punished by having their loved ones, their family members, weaponized against them. How dare they not respond to the efforts of the elders to get them to repent. And then we have this further change whereby elders will not just explain to a disfellowshipped person what they need to do in order to come back into the organization. They will explain that within a few months, they can expect another visit. That's, that's the big change or one of the big changes that Jehovah's Witnesses are supposed to be impressed about. And my question would be, where does this few months thing come from? You know, <laughs> what Bible verse, Mark Sanderson, are you going to give us where it says, in a few months, meet with them again, you elders? It's all so arbitrary, isn't it? It's also clearly just the product of some guys, some bloated fools sitting around a table and just just coming up with a plan. You know, what's going to sound good here, brothers? Uh, how long should it be before the elders meet with them again? A ah, few months. <laughs> There's absolutely no Bible verse given as a basis for this arbitrary time period. In imitation of Jehovah's mercy toward imperfect sinners, we want to reach out and help as many as possible to know that the door is open for them to come back to the congregation. If you are a disfellowship person listening to this update, we urge you to accept the efforts of the elders to help you return to the congregation. If you're living in an area where you don't know the local elders, please feel free to call or visit the local Kingdom Hall and request spiritual assistance. Jehovah wants you to come home, and we do too. In keeping with the scriptural admonition at 1 Corinthians 5.11, when a person has been removed from the congregation, we stop keeping company with that person, not even eating with such a man. That means we don't socialize with those who are removed from the congregation. However, that does not mean that a Christian could not invite a disfellowship person to attend a congregation meeting. That disfellowship person could be a relative, a former Bible student, or someone we were close to in the past. How appropriate this adjustment is at this time as we're preparing for the most important meeting of the year, the memorial, which will be held on Sunday, March 24th. What if a disfellowship person comes to a congregation meeting? Under our current arrangement, we don't say a greeting to individuals who've been removed from the congregation. However, the governing body has decided that publishers can use their Bible-trained conscience to decide whether to give a simple greeting and welcome a disfellowshipped individual who attends a congregation meeting. Hi, so good to see you here. Thank you. While we wouldn't have an extended conversation or socialize with such a person, we do not need to ignore him completely. That's the big change. That's what all the fuss is about with regards to shunning. 
if a disfellowshipped person comes back to the meeting, you can give them a simple greeting, not a complicated greeting, <laughs> not a lengthy greeting. You can't have basically a normal conversation with that person, but you are allowed to say hello. <laughs> You're allowed a few words just to make them feel welcome before they take their seat and basically be ignored or treated like they're invisible, almost invisible, by an entire congregation. You're not allowed to socialize with them. You're not allowed to have any extended conversation with a disfellowshipped person, either at the meeting or, it seems, in any other context. So this was the golden opportunity for the governing body to lift the shunning in relation to disfellowshipped family members. This was their chance to say, you know what, if your family member gets disfellowshipped, you can still talk to them. Just be kind, just be loving. Don't get into any lengthy religious conversations with them. Encourage them to go back to the meetings, but you can just have normal day-to-day -day contact with your family members and not treat them like they're invisible. This was their opportunity to do that, and they missed it. Essentially, disfellowshipped ones are still being treated as though they're invisible. The only difference is that they can now be greeted, and they can now be invited to go to the meetings. So if you are being shunned right now by Jehovah's Witness family, Expect them, unless you are a known apostate, as we're going to come to, expect them to reach out to you and say, hey, have you thought about going to the meetings? <laughs> That's the difference. Jehovah's Witnesses can now bombard you with invitations to go to the meetings. And if you go to a meeting, you can look forward to the privilege of a Jehovah's Witness saying hi to you. That's the change. That brings us to our third scripture. It's 2 John 9 to 11. There we read, Everyone who pushes ahead and does not remain in the teaching of the Christ does not have God. The one who does remain in this teaching is the one who has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your homes or say a greeting to him, for the one who says a greeting to him is a sharer in his wicked works. But doesn't 2 John 9 to 11 tell us not to say a greeting to anyone who's been removed from the congregation? In examining the context of those verses, the governing body has concluded that the Apostle John was really describing apostates and others who actively promote wrong conduct. For good reason, John strongly directed Christians not even to greet such a person because of his contaminating influence. Therefore, if a disfellowship individual is a known apostate or someone who actively promotes wrongdoing, the elders would not visit him. Neither would individual Christians greet such a person or invite him to attend a congregation meeting. So, in other words, what we now have is two-tier shunning. <laughs> there are two different types of shunning depending on how naughty you've been. If you've just been disfellowshipped for having sex with a consenting adult to whom you're not married, guess what? You can look forward to being invited to the meeting and you can look forward to Jehovah's Witnesses saying hi to you. <laughs> but if you are a Jehovah's Witness or an ex-Jehovah's Witness who leaves for conscientious reasons because you figure out that it's all a load of BS, if you figure out that none of this is true and you go so far as to use your voice and tell other people this, then you are a dreaded apostate and you miss out on this wonderful, merciful provision 
of Jehovah's Witnesses inviting you to the meeting and saying hi to you. That's what we've just heard. I guess all we need now is the cherry on the cake with this remarkable governing body update is an example of why a Jehovah's Witness might decide that this organization is a cult, is overly controlling, and something they might want to leave. Before we conclude, the governing body has asked me to read the following announcement. The governing body has decided that sisters may choose to wear slacks when participating in the ministry and when attending Christian meetings, assemblies, and conventions. If a sister chooses to wear slacks on such occasions, they should not be casual, but dignified, modest, and appropriate. When a sister has a part on the program, she should wear a skirt or a dress if that is the standard of dress in that land. Of course, some sisters may choose to wear a skirt or a dress even when they do not have a part on the program. In addition, brothers may choose not to wear a tie or a jacket when participating in the ministry and when attending Christian meetings, assemblies, and conventions. If a brother chooses not to wear a tie or a jacket on such occasions, he should dress in a manner that is appropriate, modest, and dignified, not casual. When a brother has a part on the program, he should wear a tie and a jacket, if that is the standard of dress in that land. Of course, some brothers may choose to wear a tie or a jacket even when they do not have a part on the program. When visiting Bethel, it would be appropriate for brothers to wear a tie and a jacket and for sisters to wear a skirt or a dress if that is the standard of dress in that land. Well, all I can say to that is, called it. Some of you were saying, is it going to be women wearing pants next? Yes, I can see that happening. I can see them relaxing on their dress and grooming requirements for women. The governing body has decided that sisters may choose to wear slacks when participating in the ministry and when attending Christian meetings, assemblies, and conventions. Didn't take long, did it? <laughs> Just two months. And one of the changes in my changes video thumbnail here uh, has already been implemented. Apparently now, women can now wear smart trousers or slacks when attending meetings or doing the preaching work. Again, isn't this just a reminder of how controlling this organization is? Where does it say any of this in the Bible would be my question. You know, where is the Bible justification for having these rules to begin with? For, for saying when you attend when you gather together, you need to be all dressed up. You need to be looking like you're attending some kind of business conference. Where does it say any of that in the Bible? These were all, to begin with, arbitrary rules. And now Jehovah's Witnesses are supposed to feel grateful because men no longer need to wear ties and jackets to the meetings unless they're giving parts on the program or on the platform and women can now wear pants to the meeting unless they're giving parts on the program in which case they need to show that they're women <laughs> they need to show that they are respectful of the governing body's authority and direction and and wear a skirt or wear a dress the, the <laughs> Thank you, Mark Sanderson. You know, the governing body's new Santa. <laughs> for, for giving us this present, for allowing witnesses to have a little bit more freedom in what they wear. But aren't you really showing how controlling this organisation is to begin with? 
And isn't this at the root of why you're hemorrhaging so many members? And now you're desperately trying to rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic to just tweak the shunning rules a little bit to show how merciful you are. I'm not buying it. I don't think the Norwegian government will be buying it either, to be honest. Because again, what really is the difference? Those who are disfellowshipped and shunned still can't have normal relationships, even with their family members. The best they can now hope for is that Jehovah's Witnesses will invite them to meetings. Oh, goody! <laughs> And when they go to the Kingdom Hall, someone's going to say hi and give them a brief greeting. You know, not any kind of normal human interaction or conversation. They can be greeted. Oh, thank you so much for that. You're, you're really showing us how merciful you are with these changes. Not buying it. And again, let's wait for the small print to come out in the watchtower and in the direction to elders maybe we'll find out a whole lot more once we get all of this in writing but my first impression on these changes is that they're the main thing is that the governing body have decided that too many people are being disfellowshipped to begin with and it's more a case of let's just try to slow that whole thing down. Let's just try to make it harder for someone to be disfellowshipped. And if I had to guess, once this direction comes through to elders, the message is going to be, you know what, if they say sorry, they're repentant. If, if they just express verbally that what they did was wrong and they don't plan on doing it again, that's enough. I think that's where this is going. I could be proven wrong. Let's wait and see what they come out with. But I think they're just going to allow just a token claim of repentance, which is not the case now. A judicial committee right up to March 15th, 2024, would have been almost looking for any evidence that they're not repentant, regardless of what they say. It's all about their actions. It's all about the events leading up to the wrongdoing. Have they shown true repentance or is it worldly sadness? All of these things would in so many cases lead to a judicial committee saying, we don't care if you say you're sorry. We don't care if you say you're repentant. We've decided you're not repentant and therefore you're disfellowshipped. That has happened in so many cases. And if I had to guess, the governing body are just thinking, you know, do we really want to be losing people to the point where we're turning away people who say they're sorry? Do we really want to do that when our numbers are plummeting, when we're just becoming a statistical irrelevance in terms of our growth? Or do we want to be keeping hold of as many of our followers as possible should we not just take people's word for it? Just to keep the numbers up. I think that that's what this is all about. I could be proven wrong when the actual written direction comes through, but that's my initial take on this. So I hope you found my thoughts on this useful. I've tried to get this video out as quickly as possible. But yeah, bottom line... I'm afraid this is a missed opportunity. This was the governing body's chance to reverse shunning, to make it possible for at least family members to have normal contact with their disfellowshipped loved ones. And they are just simply not merciful, are they, despite what they say? I'd be really interested to know actually what your thoughts are in the comments below. Am I more or less reading this properly or have I missed something? But that's all I have time for. Don't forget to subscribe for similar videos. And as always, thank you for watching.